good to see you guys. And um, yeah, this morning we will be looking at a passage which may be familiar, um, but I think it's very relevant to this um, time. I could have just called this the Beatitudes, but I call it the blessing of living out Christ's culture because the things that are found in the Beatitudes are, are things that are considered very countercultural. We'll see that the values that are expressed here, if I still go on, okay. Um, the values that are expressed here are very, very countercultural. So with that, sorry, I'm going to be doing double slides again today. Um, wanted to first give you the context, which is that the Beatitudes are found um, at the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. So the Beatitudes, once again, uh, this is Jesus' longest sermon found in Matthew 5 through 7. So as you can tell, we're going through Matthew 5, 1 to 12. And the Sermon on the Mount, many believe, was preached over days and hours. And that's really important because I think sometimes um, we think that, uh, you know, did they just all do this in one sitting? You know, and like, did they just sit there for hours and hours? And the point I want to make in terms of it being preached over days versus hours is that there was probably a reiteration of things that Jesus said. So it wasn't just like, a, hey, he said it one time. So when he gives us these values, it isn't just like a one-time thing. And I think that's really, really important. It's very important in practical life, for example, when we are being taught values ourselves or when we are teaching others values certain things are reinforced, right? And so we see that, you know, Jesus just, like, even when we read these verses, and even if sometimes we read a verse and we're like, wow, this might be hard to understand, I think it's also very possible that, you know, we have to kind of keep in mind that the words that are in the Bible are not the only words that Jesus spoke to his disciples. They're the ones that are recorded. They spent all day together. So it's also possible that they had further conversations about things that Jesus spoke to them about. And so that's really important. Um, some, there is also some imagery of Mount Zion. Um, there are definitely a lot of messianic um, implications that we're going to find um, within the verse. And we're not really going to touch too much on those just because for the sake of time, um, because we're not going over the entire book of Matthew. But we definitely see that um, as God um, announces his kingdom, that there definitely is this um, in the here and now, but there also is some things that are fulfilled completely in the, um, in the future. So an example of this is at the end of the sermon um, of the Beatitudes, um, he talks about those who are persecuted. And so those who are persecuted, um, I think it would be hard to say they feel blessed now as they are suffering persecution, but we see later that their reward is in the kingdom of heaven, right? So there's this sense that there is present blessing, but there also is ultimate future fulfillment um, at either our death or the second coming of Christ, okay? So that's really important. And lastly, that Matthew was written to a Jewish audience, and, and his main purpose was to affirm, made it, make it known that Jesus is king. And so this is kind of important in the sense of there's actually debate um, due to recent archaeology um, whether the book of Matthew was originally written in Hebrew and then um, translated to the Greek. And so part of, I, you know, I don't want to get into the details of that as well, as much as I want to say that Matthew has a very Jewish flavor. And so as we look at certain concepts within um, within the book of Matthew especially, we want to um, be mindful of some of those Jewish things, which I will probably just briefly highlight, but not go into how I drew those conclusions because that would just take way too much time, okay? Um, there is a quote, um, which I really like from this guy, Jonathan Pennington, he says this, Jesus' message in the sermon is that God is our Father who sees and cares about the heart not just external righteous deeds and religion. And so once again, here we see this transition, right, from, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. 
we see that um, the people that Jesus would be speaking to were so familiar with the law. They were so familiar with how Judaism worked. And, and so we see this like throughout actually the Gospels, right? We see this um, issue where, you know, there is this, this clash even when Jesus constantly bumps heads with the Pharisees between what is considered external righteousness versus this internal righteousness that, that Jesus came um, um, and how the cross changed all of that, right? Because after the cross, of course, Jesus left us the Holy Spirit who dwells within us and, and, and helps us to live um, like Christ. And so literally, it is this inside-out faith that's being lived out versus in, in the Old Testament where a lot of it was, um, was trying to, to do works, um, you know, although they were, it was accounted for by faith. Okay, so there's three big C's that I want you to know about the Beatitudes. Number one, um, they are, even though when we read them, a lot of it, um, a lot of times we take a list and, and we look at it in terms of, say, like, things to do, right? Because once you get a list, you start thinking, I'm going to start, okay, there's six things on this list. Um, three of them, no problem, but these other ones. So I'm going to focus on these other ones. But... The, but the Beatitudes, ultimately, before it becomes conduct, is about character. It's not simply a list, but it's a description of outward expression. So that would be the conduct that come from internal conclusions or dispositions that we've drawn about Jesus. Okay? So when we read the Beatitudes, like, blessed are, you know, blessed are these people, this is what will happen. That blessed part is, describes this inner um, disposition and an inner conclusion that they've drawn, that they agree with what the scripture says. You know, so when it says something like, you know, blessed are the peacemakers, we've in many ways resolved that we are going to be peacemakers, even though sometimes it's easy to um, stir up a controversy. It's easy to be involved in gossip. It's easy to... Um, be at the middle of that rather than to be a peacemaker. So ultimately, before it's a conduct issue, it's a character issue, okay? So there is character. There is also conduct, once again. These are these outward expressions where Jesus gives in, insight into a person's inside. And, and that's really a good way to sometimes think about and even examine our lives, right? Is that the things that are coming out are a reflection of the things that are going on Inside, And so if we don't like the things coming out, you know, this is um, where we examine the things that are going inside of us. And um, I'll tell you this really quick story. Um, you know, I got saved when I was 18. So before that, I hung out with a lot of people and they used a lot of foul language. And I remember the first, um, very shortly after I got saved, um, I went to a Bible study. And um, I got home, and it was about 11 o'clock at night, and so all the lights in my house were turned off. And, um, you know, I was, I was fumbling around inside. Um, I tripped on a cord, and I broke one of my mother's lamps. And the first words that came out of my mouth were, oh, blank, okay? And um, it was just a very natural, in a sense, thing to come out because I'd been doing it for the 18 plus previous years before. But the difference was actually very ironically that night, the Bible study that we had learned talked about how the words that came out of our mouth were a reflection of our heart, right? And so, you know, I, you know, I, before I apologized to my mom, I apologized to Jesus and was like, wow, something inside me is not right. Will you change that? Will you help me to change that, God? And so I think this is a picture, in a sense, of what the Beatitudes is trying to, to, to accomplish is that our conduct would be changed as a result of embracing the characteristics that Jesus is talking about, ultimately embracing the character of Christ, ultimately saying, I want this character because this is the character that Christ is telling me that he wants in me. And lastly, that it is countercultural that these kingdom values are timeless. And, and 
It also, I think, to me, shows how omniscient God is in that, you know, these, these beatitudes still um, apply today. Um, and, and even more so, I want to say, in this culture that we live in, right? How much more do we need peacemakers in this culture today? More than ever, right? More than in the time that Jesus spoke with, where there was, um, oh man, I broke the first rule of church. I didn't turn my phone off. Um, okay, so with that, um, give me a quick second and let me silent my phone so that it doesn't keep blowing up because I am in a, a part of all these chat groups too, so that can happen. Okay, um, there's a pastor who named Chip Monk and he says this, holiness is not a change of conduct. Holiness is a change of character. So I, I really like that. I think that applies to what we were just talking about. Okay, so here's the outline for today. Um, there it is. The setting of the sermon, those who depend on God, those who live for God, and those who are persecuted. Okay? So with that, we'll go to the next slide. So here's the setting of the sermon. And seeing the multitudes, he, Jesus, went up on a mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So here we see at the beginning that there, there is a little bit of argument among scholars who Jesus was talking to when he gave the Sermon on the Mount. Because, you know, it's really interesting. When a person goes up, you know, to a higher elevated place, um, just for example, this stage is slightly higher elevated than where you're seeing. They're, they're here to speak to an audience, right? But we see Jesus, he goes up on this mountain and he sits. And then it says, the scriptures say, then the disciples came to him. So there is argument whether Jesus was directly um, speaking to his disciples or whether he is speaking to everyone. And I think the most likely scenario is that he was speaking to his disciples and other people just started to gather and come around and he didn't shoo them away. And ultimately we know that all scripture, right, is written for all people, for all times. We can also look at other parts of the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, the Beatitudes is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount to definitely say, hey, you know, Jesus wasn't just talking to his disciples. For example, at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, there was a passage about, which we actually went, we, I actually preached on this before, where it talks about building your house on this foundation, right, of God's word. And we could imagine that Jesus was not just talking to his disciples. And most certainly, um, this, this applies today. So before we go into all the list of blesseds, um, I want to talk about what does it mean to be blessed. Now, it's often translated happy, and it's because it's from this Greek word. Um, oh, hang on really quick. I forgot that my computer's touch screen, so it's doing funky things. Okay. It comes from this Greek word, makarios, which means blessed, happy, and fortunate but all at once. So there actually is no single English equivalent word. So even when they say blessed um, in the Greek, it means all three of these things, that someone is blessed, happy, and fortunate at the same time. So once again, there, there, once again this is, I, I talked about this earlier, about how there's debate about whether Matthew um, was written in Hebrew. Um, most certainly we just agree once again that it is Jewish in nature. And in the Jewish mindset, the Hebrew mindset, blessing in the, is an expression of being in favor or relationship with God. So a good example of this in the Old Testament is um, having children, right? And so they would say that is a blessing from the Lord. And so we see Hannah, for example, in 1 Samuel where she is grieving um, and, it, I, and I don't think it's just simply that she loves children and wants to have her own children, but I think there's this Hebrew aspect to it where she wonders whether, you know, God has, um, has ignored her or that she's lost favor with God somehow, 
right? And so we, we see this aspect to it. There also, I think, really important is there's this if-then aspect of the condition of blessing. And so the, once again, the Beatitudes will say, blessed are those who blank. For example, blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. So the condition is, if you mourn, then you will be comforted. Okay, so there's this if-then aspect to it, almost to say almost conditionally. Okay, in a sense. And the Life Application Bible, I really like this definition because it's nice and simple, but it calls being blessed as graciously approved by God. Um, I, yeah, I actually really like that. That's good. Um, I do like what, um, oh wow, did I not? Um, I don't actually remember right now where I got this from, but it says these beatitudes are all true regardless of whether we are happy or not. And we all know a sinner can be happy even if he doesn't exhibit the Christian traits encouraged by the Beatitudes. But he won't be blessed while he... And so I wanted to just spend a second going there and just saying, if we just think of the Beatitudes as just being happy, I think we're missing a, a part of, of it, that, that it's simplifying it. And I know often we especially teach that when we're teaching younger folks, right? We're teaching um, children, for example, in Sunday school. It's a really easy, um, you know, to say happy, and it's really easy for them to understand that. But this is, is, once again, because I say it comes out of character, is this inner happiness. In fact, we see in verse 3, which technically is, in a sense, we could say the beginning of the Beatitudes, right? Because we saw verse 1, verse 2 was the setting. And then verses 10 to 12, which is towards the end, is kind of the last blessed where it talks about those who are persecuted and suffer for righteousness sake there is this inner um, disposition of that happiness that that happiness ultimately is this contentment in, um, in, in knowing that God's favor is graciously upon you because of a relationship with him okay so now we get into the first set so blessed are those, um, hang on really quick, sorry, I need to turn on my iPad again. Okay. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And so I, I called this, um, I, ca I, I called this uh, those who depend on God. Uh, we could also call it those who are needy for God. But it speaks of a humility that leads God's people to depend wholly on him. So when we look at these, um, those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, um, it, it, it describes this inner place where they've come to such a place of brokenness um, that they've been humbled, okay? Okay, let me try this. It's important as we see a list once again that we understand that it is not a multiple choice, but it's to be taken as a whole, and an example of this, for example, is when we see the fruit of the spirits, right? We might say love, joy, peace, patience, right? You know, goodness, so forth, so forth, right? Um, it's really easy for, it, it would be really easy for someone to, if we just looked at it like a list, we'll just say, hey, you know what? I need to be more joyful. Let me work on being more joyful. But you know what? I, do I really need to be loving or, or peaceful? Or do I really need to grow in those areas? And so it's really important that we see every single one of these things on this list as, as essential. And not just, you know, because I, I think we have that tendency when we see a list to just zone in on a couple of things on the list. And, and that's not how God meant for it to be. It's actually that each item on that list really matters. There is general agreement that the first three Beatitudes reflect Isaiah 61 one to three, and the context of that is that God is returning to Zion to restore his people after they have repented, and this happens in Isaiah 59, 
and good news is brought to the poor. In Isaiah 57, 7, 15, the poor as described are those who are lowly in spirit. And that's the same thing here. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. I'm going to be going back and forth between these two slides, okay? So theirs is um, the kingdom of God. So once again, those now, and there's this now, once again, there's this now and not yet aspect to it, right? Because there's a sense that the kingdom of God, when Jesus arrived, was here then, right? Whenever you hear the word kingdom, there has to be a king. And so, in a sense, when Jesus arrived, right, he's king. He's always been king. From the get-go, he's been king. And so, when Jesus arrived on earth, he brought the kingdom with him. But the kingdom will not see its ultimate fulfillment until his second coming. Okay, and so, one way to kind of distinguish between the two comings, you know, you'll find places, for example, in the book of John, where, where Jesus will say something like, um, you know, I, I, I didn't come to judge you. But then in that same um, sense, um, there's a sense where, well, he came and he gave us the gospel. And it's really straightforward. You're either on one side or the other. And ultimately, you know, in that verse in John, he talks about how, you know, ultimately we're going to be the ones judging ourselves based on this decision that we make. Christ. But there's a sense where judgment won't happen until a later time. Okay, so does this make sense? So the first time Jesus came, he came and he brought a message of salvation, right? He changed the whole system of how people related to God from this Old Testament sacrificial system to be the perfect Lamb of God that was slain for us, right? And the sacrifice for our sins. And so the first time he came, he came especially to bring this message of salvation. But the second time Jesus comes will be a time of judgment, right? And so that's really important. So while we're in this between first and second part, we want to be people that bring this message of salvation so that people are on the right side of that, right? Right? And so blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who recognize that spiritually they are so poor that they can't save themselves, that they need a savior. And that savior has shown himself in the Bible as Jesus Christ. Blessed are those who mourn. And specifically here, um, it is those who mourn over their sins. Now, there is argument among scholars whether, because remember I said this goes back to um, Isaiah 61, there are those who would argue that um, Jesus here is only talking about the nation of Israel. As, um, but then there are those who would say that, um, that, no, this refers to those who are individually mourning. And there were those who would even say that this relates to verses 10 and 12 at the end of the, um, at the, end of the, the Beatitudes here, where it talks about those who are persecuted. I would say that it's all of them. That those most certainly in the context, especially with verse 3, um, I would say that are definitely those who mourn over their sins. They receive blessing in this time, and they receive blessing in, in, in the future, right? But also those who are persecuted, those who are at this place of, of, of um, yeah, that, that they shall be comforted by God. You know, I want to say something about persecution and, and how it relates to our daily life. Because I think sometimes we, we want to think about persecution like in a dramatized fashion. I remember being 
you know, you know, we used to, I don't know who started this in one of my old youth groups, and I don't know where, what the thinking was, but, you know, there was a question like, okay, you know, if someone put a gun to your head and said, said denounce Jesus or die, what would you do? You know, and, um, and most of us, I think, would like to answer a certain way. I don't know that we actually would in that moment. Um, but we almost think of persecution as being in that situation. But I want to remind you that the Bible tells us that we're supposed to carry our cross daily. That we're actually that we are dying daily. And I actually think the more that I read about different people who have been martyred and, and different people, I, I want to say this, and it's going to sound weird. I want to say actually, I think being martyred for Christ um, is actually a privilege. And I actually tend to see that the people who do get martyred um, are people who have been dying daily to themselves. You know, in a sense, it's John 3.30, it's right. He must increase, but I must decrease. That's what it means to die to yourself, right? That you're less like yourself in whatever area that is for the sake of becoming more like Jesus in that area. And so I want to I kind of bring that idea up because I think we often um, miss that. Like we want that big wow, aha moment. And okay, this proves that, that I um, belong to God. But I think actually it might actually be harder to just die daily to yourself than to be put in this one moment where you've got to make this decision. And actually, the way I tried to answer that question, I like to believe that this is what I would do, is I would try to bargain with this guy and say, okay, give me 12 minutes. Don't shoot any of the kids. So if this ever happened to my youth group, give me 12 minutes. Let me share something with you for 12 minutes. And then if you don't like it, you can shoot me. But just leave the kids alone. So that, that's how I think I would do it as a youth pastor. I don't, I don't know. You know, I don't know that they would accept those terms, but that, that's how I would do it, okay? So, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek is only used three other times in the New Testament, and in each occasion, twice in Matthew, once in 1 Peter, um, the word gentle is used. But this meekness um, actually goes back to Psalm 37, where it says, for evildoers shall be cut off by those who wait for the Lord. Those will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. See, blessed are those who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Because we tend to think that those who are aggressive, those who are ruthless, those who are arrogant, those who are harsh, are the ones who get ahead in life and they get everything, right? I mean, I don't know and, you know, and uh, I, guess, I guess technically since I'm not technically working right now since I'm doing an internship, I can, I can say this. Uh, most of the times when we see the, the CEOs of our company, I don't know what you think of them, but they tend to sometimes be very aggressive, obnoxious, rich people who kind of think that they're one step above, if not multiple steps, above everyone else because of the car they drive or because of how much money they have or, or, or this and that. Um, <laughs> I remember one time um, my boss, um, the CEO of our company, called all of us in our department into a room and he basically yelled at us and I'll just say it, it wasn't really our fault he, he basically gave us permission to do something, but then he gave another physician pos permission to do the same thing, and then they and, and then the people in the other physician who were motivated by permission for sales um, kind of broke a lot of rules. So we got the brunt of it, and I remember during that meeting, he pulled out a wad of $100 bills for his pocket. I, there must have been at least $20,000, $30,000 and he threw it in the trash can. He said, this is what you guys are doing to me. And all of us were scared, you know, um, although um, 
in my funny um, whatever, I looked at one of my friends and we both kind of chuckled because we were both thinking the same thing. Like, ooh, I want to go into that trash can and <laughs> pull out those hundred dollar bills, right? Um, but um, but he goes on and um, you know and he goes around the room and he asks us like whether we think we're juniors or seniors and he basically insults all of us and uh, and then walks away, you know. And so this is kind of the picture that we get, almost like ooh. Like, ooh, this is the way that the world is. You want to get ahead in the world. You need to step on other people. You know, um, for me, I had multiple occasions for promotions in my workplace. But one of the things that always held me back was that you, your entire life was given over to it. Like, you have to be available on Sundays. And so I always turned down those chances to go for promotions because I knew where I wanted to be on Sundays. And the one time I went for a manager's position, I remember just being at this place where I felt like the employees were treated so badly. And, and I felt like, man, if I could you know, get in there, like I can try to make things better for the people in our department. And I want to say, I think as Christians, that that's a good way for us to think about the workplace. That as we get promoted, it's not to promote ourselves, but it's actually to bring up the people, our coworkers, those under us, to, to try to use our position to also elevate them. Like I said, this is so countercultural because we think of, you know, just of it in that way. But it says, Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Okay. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Oops, let me go backwards. So, once again, as we look at this, there is this idea of, once again, the kingdom of heaven. That's their inheritance, the poor in spirit. So it's those who recognize how spiritually poor they are. Those who mourn, they will be comforted by God. And it, it's written in a divine, uh, you know, in a passive way. So this is a divine passiveness. Is not only will they be comforted, but specifically that they will be comforted by God. And that is such a difference when we mourn. There is a difference. I, I see it all the time at my work when I see those who are of um, the Christian faith and, and those who are those who are not. In fact, um, I had a patient the other day who um, he passed, and when the um, EMTs brought him in, um, there was a stench. I was just in his boxers and you know and just on the on the gurney and they put him to the bed and they continued trying to do CPR on him and after a couple of minutes they they stopped and the reason for that stench is um, I don't know how many days this guy was unconscious for or how long he was unconscious but he had you know soiled himself and and um, and so when his family arrived and I met with them, um, they were really honest with me about how, um, you know, the father arrived first and then the two siblings arrived later. They were really honest with me about how this man um, had, you know, abused uh, certain substances and, and this was his lifestyle. But this family um, was very strong in their faith. And I remember the four of us, um, you know, so the father, the brother, the sister, um, kneeling in the emergency room, and, and we prayed. And, um, and the brother um, led the prayer, and he, um, he was able to thank God for just all the times that, um, that his brother um, went to church. You know, it was too late to pray for his salvation. But, you know, they they believed there was a good chance that he was saved. I think
think that's a great picture of those who mourn and they should be comforted, and particularly that they were comforted by God. They actually were not comforted by their chaplain. I don't. I didn't do very much. I just let God take, you know, just, you know, take the lead, right, and, and just got out of his way. Um, blessed are the meek, once again, those who are humble, those who um, are gentle, those who are not seeking to step on other people to inherit the earth. And once again, I want you, this is a eternal perspective. It's really important that we see that. In fact, we see this same um, thing going on in Psalm 73, where the psalmist um, is miserable because he sees that everyone around him is lying, cheating, stealing, and getting ahead in life. And he's like, well, God, what's the point of following you if people around me are doing evil and they seem to be getting ahead in life and I'm miserable as I watch this? And then it says that, and, it, and then, you know, the, the psalmist then says that he, when he goes into God's sanctuary, then he understood. He said, I understood their end. And he comes to this place in Psalm, you know, 73, um, 25, where he says, um, it might be 24, basically says, heaven and earth has nothing that I desire besides you. So after seeing everything from this eternal perspective, this kingdom of heaven perspective, it puts everything back into proper perspective. And so we see that the meek will inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. And this idea of hungry and thirsty for, for righteousness is this Longing with, with strong desire to, to satisfy. So those who hunger and thirst, it says they shall be filled. Those who live for God. It says, blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Those who are merciful obtain mercy. I think even in just hearing that, I think we understand that, right? I think that there's times when I, one, one thing I really love about the scriptures and, you know, and I spend a lot of time, of course, studying them and trying to um, basically take very complicated concepts sometimes and just put it into everyday language. But I think we have probably found in our experience that when we are merciful to people, when we are um, kind and forgiving, and, and when we can be upset with someone, but instead we choose to be gentle about it, we find that people actually are often that way to us. And, and so I, I almost don't go into a lot of explanation with this because blessed are those who are merciful. They shall obtain mercy. And Grant Osborne says, the reward here is both given by and shown by God. And that's great. Whenever we, a lot of times as we see words in the Bible, like we always go back to God, right? Like when we see words like mercy and grace and sacrifice, it isn't just like this thing that we're trying to attain, but when we look at Jesus, and we see that is his very character. That makes it a reference point for us, right? Because anyone in the world can sacrifice. Anyone in the world can show mercy. It probably is not typical, but I'm also saying it's not something that we never see. But the difference, once again, is this inside outness for us. It's this idea that we see our Lord who's merciful. That when we think about sacrificing for somebody, we think about the cross. And, and so there is this, this inside outness to that. Do you guys see that? that? That it's not just because I'm just gonna be kind because I want, I'm gonna be merciful because I want people to think I'm a nice person. 
I'm going to be merciful because I want to have a good reputation among people. I want to be merciful because my Lord is merciful. And I want to, um, I want people to see him in me. Okay? The pure in heart shall see God. And um, Hebrews 12, 14 puts it like this. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Psalm 24 puts this idea of holiness as those who can ascend the hill of the Lord, right? Those with clean hands and pure hearts. So it's this idea of being able to ascend up the hill of God is once again those who are pure in heart. And of course we know that our hearts (laughs) are purified by just going to Jesus, right? By the washing of his word, right? Um, blessed are those who are, are peacemakers. They shall be called sons of God. Um, those who experience the shalom of God become his agents, establishing his peace in the world. This connotes both peace with God and peace between people. So ultimately, those who are peacemakers are people who are at peace um, with God. Those who are persecuted, it's our last part. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you for falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so once again, we see this idea, and, and this is the... Once again, the, we see so much reference, right, to this kingdom of heaven. This one really requires an eternal perspective. That our persecution now um, results in, um, in future blessing. There may be some blessing in the, um, in the future. Um, I'm sorry, in the present. I don't know, it's hard to see. I, I'm trying to think of a scenario where there might be like that. Maybe there is, maybe you're sharing the gospel with someone and somebody totally ridicules you, but someone else is there and they hear it. And they're like, wow, something's you know, off with this guy, but something seemed right with this guy. And somehow that brings them to Christ. Maybe that is an example of a blessing. But here's the idea of persecution. The major premise is this. Jesus and his followers are one. The minor premise is the world will hate and persecute Jesus and his values. Right? Jesus says, hey, don't be surprised if the world hates you. It hated me first. And the conclusion is that the world will hate and persecute you and the values of Jesus that you hold. Now, I do want to emphasize that we are being persecuted for Jesus' sake, okay? So if we're being persecuted for being stupid (laughs) or being persecuted for um, giving truth but not grace, um, I remember the first time I heard the gospel, it was definitely fire and brimstone. Here's the gospel. It was truthful, but you want to burn in hell and the people that were giving me that message I felt I was living a better life than they were right so we want to be persecuted for Jesus' sake and not just because so there is someone who wrote something called the unbeatitudes and I want to close with reading it wretched is the spiritually self-sufficient for theirs is the kingdom of hell wretched are those who deny the reality of their sinfulness for they will be troubled Wretched are the self-centered, for they will be emptied. Wretched are those who ceaselessly justify themselves, for their efforts will be in vain. Wretched are the merciless, for no mercy shall be shown to them. Wretched are those with impure hearts, for they will not see God. Wretched are those who reject peace, for they will earn the title sons of Satan. And wretched are the uncommitted for conscience' sake, For their destination is hell. So brothers and sisters, I pray that these kingdom values um, will be something that come out of us um, 
inside out. Um, let's go to the Lord in, in prayer. Father, this morning I give you thanks for my brothers and sisters here that we could just uh, study your word together and hear it together. And God, uh, help one another in obeying your word. Thank you, God, that your values are different from the values of this world because we live in this world. We see what's going on. And, um, and sometimes, God, it's very, very difficult to see. God, this morning we pray for the your shalom over Jerusalem. We pray for your shalom over the people of Israel. We pray for Hamas to be found, that this conflict can be put to an end soon. And God, we pray for people there filled with mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. God, we pray for your mercy and your grace over that situation. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Can we invite the worship team to come back up?